Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to morning worship at St. Michael in the Hamlets for the Sunday of James the Apostle. We'll talk about him in a minute, but just a couple of admin things. Firstly, I published the bands of marriage between Thomas James Marshall, single of this parish, with a qualifying connection to St. John's Alvanley, and Zoe Grace Tattersall, single of this parish, also with a qualifying connection to St. John's Alvanley. So this is for the third time of asking, if any of you know any reason in law why these persons may not marry each other, you are to declare it now. So shall we pray for them? Father God, we ask you to be with Thomas and Zoe in their preparations for their forthcoming marriage. Be with them on the day and let them know your love and care with all the people there. And in the future, be with them in their future lives together. May their home be a place of peace, laughter, and love. And we ask these things in the name of our precious Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. There's a couple of admin things. You will know, of course, that the government has now removed the mandatory requirements to wear masks and social distance. But the PCC met together and decided, for the time being, we respectfully request that you continue to wear a mask and socially distance in church. That's accordance with the advice given by the World Health Organization and also the local health board who said in places of worship we should wear masks. So please, if you don't mind, will you continue to wear them? If for any reason you decide not to wear one, would you let the wardens know and they'll respectfully direct you to a seat so that we're not cross-contaminated? You also, you're now allowed to sing, but again, the PCC respectfully requests that if you sing, you wear your mask, because obviously we know we're told if you speak loud or sing, your breath goes further, so there's a possibility if you were infected, you could harm others. So again, we respectfully request that if you're singing, you wear a mask, please. Uh, I think it's been a bit of a mix-up, but I think Keith asked as well that we continue until the end of August to book with Karen so we know who's coming and out. We've got a record of people coming and out, if you don't mind, please. And we'll review that at the end of August. Uh, one more notice that it's next week is Moses week. Now Moses, our brother in, in Ghana, works under very difficult conditions and he really appreciates the hundred or so pounds we send him every month because in Ghanaian terms that's like 2,000 sedis. So it helps keep his vehicle going but also in the, in the time since he went back to Ghana being with us he's built three churches and a new church school and with the help of our funding has put roofs on them so thank you very much for supporting him and I ask you if you can be as generous as you can next week. We committed to a minimum of pound but if you can give more we will be very grateful. So now we begin the service. This Sunday is the service of James the Apostle. You may notice that the liturgy of colour has changed from green to red. Normally in Trinity we have green but today is red. Not, we haven't changed it because we like the, the different colour. That's to mark the fact that James who is the brother of John and the cousin of Jesus and one of the twelve disciples was the first of that band to be martyred. Now what does the word martyr mean? Well actually it means witness and it came to mean those who prepared to witness to Christ even when they were threatened with death or put to death. It's nothing to do with terrorism, it's those who are faithful to Christ even to the end. So today we celebrate James the Apostle. So now we gather together before God to give him thanks and praise, to seek his forgiveness and to ask for his blessing. Welcome in the name of Christ. God's grace, mercy and peace be with you. O Lord, open our lips and our mouths shall proclaim your praise. God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. And our first hymn of some traditional hymns today, O oh, Worship the Lord.
And our opening prayer. Lord God, we have come to worship you. Help us to pray to you in faith, to sing your praise with gratitude, to listen to your word with eagerness, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now we come to a time when we look over the past week and think about things which we perhaps shouldn't have done or things which we should have done, should have done which we haven't, and we seek God's forgiveness. St. Paul says, be imitators of God. Love as Christ loved. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Put away all anger and bitterness, all slander and malice. So let us confess our sins to God, who forgives us in Christ, saying together, O King enthroned on high, filling the earth with your glory, holy is your name, Lord God Almighty. In our sinfulness we cry to you to take our guilt away and to cleanse our lips to speak your word through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Lord enrich us with his grace and nourish us with his blessing. The Lord defend us in trouble and keep us from all evil. The Lord accept our prayers and absolve us from all our offences. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Now the Collect Prayer for the eighth Sunday after Trinity. And we say together, Lord God, your Son left the riches of heaven and became poor for our sake. When we prosper, save us from pride. When we are needy, save us from despair, that we may trust in you alone. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now we come to our Gospel reading, read for us by Sharon. And the Gospel reading is taken from Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 to 28. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Matthew 20, verses 20 to 28, a mother's request. Then the mother of Zebedee's son came to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down asked a favour of him. What is it you want, he asked. She said, Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit on your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I am going to drink? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit on my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my father. When the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Now, I do apologise, we had a nice children's video to do the reading, but for some reason when Rob tried to load it, it wouldn't do it. So the computer says no, so nobody's fault, but I do apologise. So I'd like now to look at that reading of the mother of the two apostles who wanted them to be put on Jesus' right and Jesus' left because Jesus explained to them that wasn't his to give. Now this passage sheds a light upon the Christian life. Jesus said that those who would share his triumph must drink his cup. What was that cup? It was to James and John that Jesus spoke. Now life treated James and John very differently. James was the first of the apostles to die a martyr. And Acts 12 verse 2 tells us that 
The Jewish religious authorities went to King Herod and started to complain about this growing church. And to make an example, Herod put James the sword. But on the other, for him, the cup was martyrdom. On the other hand, by far the greater weight of tradition goes to show that John, who wrote the Gospel of John, lived to a great old age in Ephesus and died a natural death when he must have been nearly 100 years old. Because the Gospel of John, of course, was written between AD 90 and 100. For him, the cup was the constant discipline and struggle of the Christian life throughout all the years. It's quite wrong to think that the Christian cup must always mean a short, sharp, bitter, agonizing struggle of martyrdom. The cup may be the long routine of Christian life, with its daily sacrifice, its daily struggle and its heartbreaks, and its disappointments and tears. A Roman coin was once found with an ox on it, and the ox was facing two things, an altar and a plough, and the inscription read, ready for either, <laughs> ready for either, excuse me. The ox has to be ready for either the supreme moment of sacrifice or the long labor of the plow on the farm. There's no one cup for Christians to drink. That cup may be drunk, drunk in one great moment, but that cup may be drunk throughout a lifetime of Christian living. To drink the cup simply means to follow Christ wherever he may lead and to be like him in any situation life may bring. This passage sheds a light on Jesus. It shows us his kindness. The amazing thing about Jesus is that he never lost patience and became irritated. In spite of all he had said, here were these men and their mother still chattering about posts in an earthly government. You know, they wanted to be the most important people. But Christ doesn't explode at their obtuseness or blaze at their blindness or despair at their inability to learn. In gentleness and sympathy and love, with never an impatient word, he seeks to lead them to the truth. It shows us his honesty. It's quite clear there was a bitter cup to be drunk and he, Jesus didn't hesitate to say so. No one can ever flame claim to have begun to follow Jesus under false pretenses. He never failed to point out that even if life ends with crown wearing, it continues in cross bearing. It shows us his trust in his followers. He never doubted that James and John would maintain their loyalty. They had their mistaken ambitions, they had their blindness, they had their wrong ideas but he never dreamt of writing them off as bad debts. He believed that they could and would drink the cup. Two different cups were for both of them. One of the fun fundamental facts to which we must hold on, even if we hate, loathe and despise ourselves, is that Jesus believes in us. Christians are men and women put upon their honour by Jesus. At the request of James and John, not so nasty, annoyed the other disciples because of that, you know, hierarchy. The disciples, they did not see why the two brothers should steal a march on them, even if they were the cousins of Jesus. Now, I'm just pausing for a bit. Now, I'd normally ask for some volunteers with COVID. I'm going to have to do a Tommy Cooper. Constable. Inspector. Now, I'm going to ask you, put your hand up, who you think is the most important? I'm not going to do it now, I'm going to wait till the end of the talk. So the question James and John not unnaturally annoyed the other disciples. They did not see why two brothers should steal a march on them, even if they were the cousins of Jesus. They did not see why they should state their claim to preeminence. And Jesus knew what was going on in their minds. And he spoke to them words which are the very basis of Christian life. 
Out in the world, said Jesus, it's quite true that greatness is seen in some who control others. Those whose words must, to whom we must leap and who at the wave of a hand can have their slightest need attended to. Out in the world, the Roman governor with his retinue or the powerful local ruler with his slaves was seen as important. The world counts them great, but among my followers, Jesus said, service alone is the badge of greatness. And greatness doesn't consist in commanding others to do things for you. It consists in doing things for others. And the greater the service, the greater the honour. Now, Jesus uses a kind of grand gradation. If you wish to be great, he says, be a servant. If you wish to be first of all, be a slave. Here's the Christian revolution. Here's the complete reversal of the world's standards. A complete new set of values has been brought to life. The world instinctively knows quite well that good men and women are people who serve others. The world will respect and admire and sometimes fear the powerful, but will love those who love. The doctor will come out at any time of day or night to save patients. The minister who is always on the road to speak to amongst other people. The employer who takes an active interest in the lives and troubles of their employees. The person to whom we can go and never be made to feel a nuisance. These are the people who everyone loves and in whom instinctively we see Jesus Christ. When the great Japanese saint, Toyohiko Kagawa, first came into contact with Christianity, he felt its fascination for it until one day the cry burst out of him, oh, make me like Christ. To be like Christ, he went into the slums, even though he himself was suffering from tuberculosis, and it seemed the last place on earth a man like him should go. He went to live in a six by six hut in the Tokyo slum. And on the first night, he was asked to share his bed with a man suffering from a contagious itch. And that was the test of his faith. Would he go back to, on his point of no return? No, he welcomed his bedfellow. The next day, the, the beggar asked for his shirt, which he gave to him. And the day after that, the beggar asked for his coat and trousers, and he gave them too. Kaga was left standing in a ragged old kimono. Now the slum dwellers laughed at him, but became to respect him for what he did. He stood in the driving rain to preach, coughing all the time. God is love, he said. Where love is, there is God. It tells us in the Bible, doesn't it? Those who do not love do not know God, for God is love. He often fell down exhausted, and the rough men of the slums gently carried him back to his hut. Now, Kagawa himself once wrote, God dwells among the lowliest of men. He sits on the dust heap among the prison convicts. He stands with the juvenile delinquents. He is with the beggars. He is amongst the sick. He stands with the unemployed. Therefore, let him who would meet God visit the prison cell before going to the temple. Before he goes to church, let him visit the hospital. Before he reads the Bible, let him help the beggar. And therein is greatness. The world may assess people's greatness by the number of people who they can control and who are at their beck and call, or by their intellectual standing or academic eminence, or by the number of committees of which they are members, or by the size of their bank balances or the, the possessions they've amassed. But in the assessment of Jesus Christ, these things are completely irrelevant. His assessment is quite simple. How many people have they helped? Amen. Right. Put your hand up if you think this person is the most important. Put your hand up if you think this person is the most important. Put your hand up if you think neither is more important than the other. And I think you're right. They have different jobs to do, and the police obviously have, dis have to have a disciplined structure because they deal with dynamic situations. But the funny thing about the police in this country is constables are not the only constables. 
When you're sworn in by a magistrate, you take the office of constable and you hold that 24-7, 365 years, on or off duty. And what Parliament says, when it grants powers to police officers, says a constable may arrest without warrant, or may, a constable may search, or a constable may require roadside breath test. And Parliament, with very few exceptions, says may. So nobody can actually order a police officer to make an arrest or refrain from making an arrest. They can be disciplined, of course, if they use them inappropriately. But the only body of people can actually order a policeman or a policewoman, or should I say police constable, police officers, to make an arrest are magistrates and judges who can issue a warrant, but that's a different thing. So Sir John Murphy once commented, although he's the chief constable in all the major powers, he has no more power than the most junior Bobby. So the whole organisation is dependent on everybody doing their, their job. I learned the hard way that when you supervise people, you must respect them for what they do. You have to earn their respect before you can ask them to do things which are required. I used to tell the cleaners off of them for saying, I'm only the cleaner. But when you look at it, in Victorian days, when people died of cholera and typhoid because there was no proper sanitation, there was no sewers and, and drains or whatever, nobody knew about hand wash. Even doctors were killing people because they didn't really know about sterilisation. The job of the cleaner, in many respects, is the most important because we take them for granted, don't we? But they keep us clean. And when you think about it, they are probably saved more lives than others. Here's one more prop kindly made by my team. Now, if you look at the police, the chief constable at the top, deputy chief constable, assistant chief constables, chief superintendents, superintendents, chief inspectors, inspectors, sergeants, and constables are the main body. And they're the people you're most likely to meet. But all contribute to a well-run police force. Now, if we look at the church, and probably wrongly, mistakenly, we, we see the church the same thing, don't we see? Archbishops, bishops, cathedral deans and archdeacons, area deans, rectors, vicars, uh, curates, and so-and-so, and, and also at the bottom, who are the main body of the church. And you can be given for thinking that's the way it works. But Jesus did that. And there's Jesus, and there's the people who've been here long enough. And the most important people are the new people, new Christians and children. And that's the way Christ works. As Keith said, Jesus turns the whole thing upside down. And that should be our model. That nobody's you know, more important to Christ, we're all equal. And if we serve in a particular position, we must understand that we're in a position of service. Amen. Now I'm ask you to stand as we declare our faith in the Apostles' Creed. saying together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven he is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Would you please be seated? Now, you may, if you're new, wonder why we say we believe in the Holy Catholic Church. Catholic with a small c, we means worldwide, universal. So when we pray for the Holy Catholic Church, we pray for Roman Catholic Christians, Eastern Orthodox Christians, Anglican Christians, Protestants, whatever. We're talking about the whole, God's whole church. So now before Val leads us in prayer, we're gonna sing, oh, we're gonna hear the hymn, well, sing if you want to behind your mask. Come, let us sing of a wonderful love. And please treat this as part of prayer time.
where two or three are gathered in love's name for love's purpose, to listen, not to speak, to wait on the Lord, not to tell him what to do, then God is present, love is present, and Jesus of Nazareth rises again from the tomb. Faithful and loving God, as a shepherd cares for his sheep, so you love and care for us. We come to this house of prayer to hear your holy word spoken and to ask forgiveness for our sins. Fill our hearts with your gracious love that our lives may tell of your glory in Jesus Christ our Lord. Father, in all the decision-making problems and challenges of our church, we ask for your counsel and encouragement. We pray for Keith, the wardens and all members of the PCC as they plan for the future of the church. Support them in their decisions and planning as they look after the finances and other plans as we go forward to reopen with caution. Help us to respect each other's decisions and keep each one of us safe. Lord God, we bring to you those who we know are suffering with long-term illness, debilitating pain and emotional distress. Lay your hands on them to bring relief and healing, courage to live through the darkness and the inner strength which only you can give. We pray for those who are called to care for those who are ill in body, mind and spirit, that they may bring your healing love and comfort. We remember especially those who are known to us, Jackie and Dave Champion, Carol Haskell, Sue Hanks, Lillian Earle, Brian Abrams, Beatrice Colley, Alwyn Fowler. We pray for John Pritchard and the family and think of Mary Pritchard having a cataract removed tomorrow. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the times of rest and relaxation which we have during the summer months. We pray for all those who are able to enjoy a break with their families. Help us to use our leisure and holidays to rebuild our bodies and renew our minds, that we may be strengthened and refreshed when we return to our daily work. God our Father, we thank you for all the gifts around us that add so much joy to our daily lives. For the sun that warms us and the air that gives us life. For the loveliness of the natural world. For the changing seasons, each in its own way beautiful. For our homes and family and friends. For health of body and soundness of mind. For music, books and art. For the land of our birth, the land that we love for the lives and examples of those who have done good works. For all these blessings and for all your love, we give you thanks. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And gathering our prayers and praise into one, as our Saviour has taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Now I realized before the talk, I missed the hymn out. So I wonder if Bobby could go back so we have a gospel and then we'll continue the service.
So thank you very much for being with us today. And I'd like to thank everybody for their continued support of St Michael's, coming in difficult times, supporting us financially. A special word to our children and young people who normally would go to children's church but sit through an adult service. I apologise we didn't have the children's video today. But you young people have been an example of good behaviour to us all. And we know for some children and some adults really, it's difficult to sit with a lot of people or, or noisy hymns. And we hope that you are kind, you know, and, and, and accept this. It's not, being in church reverence is not about being respectable. It's about being kind and loving. All right, one thing I say as well, that sometimes, you know, people come into a service and say, oh, I've been very inspired by that, whatever. And other times they say, well, I don't think God was there today. Well, Father Moses said to me about this. We used to have a, a prayer group with Alan Studley, myself, Phil Booth, and Father Moses joined us. Father Moses said this, if you came into church looking for God, you've made a mistake because God doesn't live here. What you need to do is bring God in with you. Because when we leave, God doesn't wait there sitting on the altar. God goes out with us because God lives here. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. For loving creation, for heaven restored, for grace of salvation, O oh, praise ye the Lord, our final hymn. May the God of all hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit we may abound in hope. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Hello. Over recent months, we have done our best to keep you informed 
of the financial challenge we are facing to bridge our income gap, sustain our buildings and clergy, as well as our mission and ministry within the local community. Little did we know when we began this process, which we have called stepping up to the plate, of the further challenge we would be faced with due to COVID-19. As our church buildings have been closed for the past few months, we have lost regular rental income from the church hall in Belgrave Road, as well as collections from our church services. The work of our church is reliant on people's generosity. We do not receive uh, anything in the way of funds from uh, the diocese. If you feel that you are in a position to help, there are many ways you can do so. Some people give through the parish giving scheme. Uh, one can also give through by direct debit or a one-off payment. Details of how you can do this will be on the following slide. Thank you so much for your generosity and your support of the church in so many different ways. God bless you.